What you see behind me is all that's left of the 1916 Panama Pacific Exposition. It's now the home of the Exploratorium here in San Francisco. It's a hands-on science museum dedicated toward arousing curiosity in people of all ages. Scientific American Magazine called it the best science museum in the world. Well, today we're going to visit some highlights of it, and then we're going to go to Fort Mason to visit the new outdoor exploratorium, and we're going to conclude by checking out the deeply mysterious wave organ, which is located on a jetty in San Francisco Bay, not far from here. So you've got to see that. She touches it. Oh, yeah. Alright, go ahead. Come on, put out your hand. Alright, put your hand over here. You gonna do it? Put your hand over here. Some people have more than others. Fat. It's fat. Fat and muscle. So fat and muscle surrounds the eye, and humans have six muscles in their eye. Cows have seven. So the six, six of them are the same except for the seventh one. The seventh one that a cow has is to pull its eye back into its socket. And they use that to kind of protect themselves from um, uncut grass when they're grazing because it, it hurts and it's not pleasant. So he's cutting away all the fat and muscle around the eye so we can get a look at the core eye, the main part of it. And we use cow eyes because they're similar to human eyes and they're about three to five times bigger yes. than human eyes so it, can, <laughs> it gives us a better look than our own eyes. 
Oh, you're just a pro now, aren't you? Yeah, that's what I am. Alright. Alright, so while that's going around, he's gonna this blue part that he has is called the uh, cornea. And usually it's not blue, but the reason it is blue is because all of this stuff that just came out. This liquid is called aqueous humor, and it acts like the blood of the eye, and um, usually it's clear, but it's only dark like that because um, the cow's been dead, so things are starting to decompose. He made an incision on the side of the eye, the white part, which is called the sclera, so he can get a, see what's on the inside. This one's. Jello. Oh, uh, well, this this one you don't want to. This is called this is called ventrous humor, and what it does is it gives your eye its shape, and without it, your eye would kind of fall on itself and on itself. And usually, the lens is inside, right in the middle, but we can just take it out. So now we have the core lens. Can you see me? Maybe not. Can you see me? Can I, can I see that? You see that? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> you see me? Yeah. Well, how do I look? Am I upside down? No, uh, it's sort of blurry. No, no. That's because now we're at the back of the eye. Alright, that big dangly slimy thing, it's called the retina. The ret yes, that's the retina. <laughs> your retina has all your rods and cones in it. And the rods help you see shapes and in different lighting conditions. Cones help you see color. So if I take that off, yeah, it's gone. <laughs> but the retina is connected to this little spot. And that spot's called your blind spot. Everyone has it. And there's actually an exhibit in the back that will help you find your blind spot. Your brain makes up the difference for your blind spot, so you don't even notice that it's there. And that blind spot, if you flip it over, it, it, keywords, it, <laughs> the blind spot is connected to your optic nerve, and your optic nerve is connected to your brain. So that's how you process all your visual information. It goes through all those different steps. So if he squeezes your op the optic nerve, you see all these little white fibers. And it just looks like pus. But really what it is is billions and trillions of nerve fibers in a myelin sheath. And all these fibers are the reason we can't have eye transplants. So I can't take your eye and put it in my head. I can't take your eye and put it in her head because of those fibers. If you miss just one when you're trying to reconnect it, the whole procedure is for nothing and it's, it's pretty much impossible to do. So now, the, uh, how many people have cats and dogs? Ooh. Have you guys ever seen their eyes kind of glow at night when you turn on the light? Yeah. Nocturnal animals have something called a torpedum, which looks just like that. It's all blue and shiny. So at night when you see your cat's and dog's eyes glow, you're seeing their torpedum. Cows are nocturnal, but they have one. They have one because they're most active at dawn and dusk. And so when you look into someone's pupil and you see their, uh, yeah, you see their pupil, that's what you're seeing. Yes, sir. That's someone not turning off the flower dissection all the way. That's part of the flower. Yes, ma'am. How see color? Yes, because they have a retina with rods and cones. They might not see as distinctly as we do, but they still see color. Okay.
Magnetic fields are by their nature invisible. If you were above one given region of Mars' surface, you might see magnetic field lines bursting out straight towards you. And as they get closer to you, they start to curve away and turn. They zoom off into the distance and they bend back and they're diving back out. Impacts on this neutralizer field, the Earth field, and therefore the particles that are attached to this field can come out and bombard the atmosphere and that creates a little bit of
Of the many exhibits at the new Outdoor Exploratorium at Fort Mason, none is as interesting and empowering as the pier piling pivot. With a simple press of a button, a geared motor swings a specifically designed piling out of the water so that visitors can see the species of plant and animal life occupying this unique shoreline environment. At night, the color-coded patterns of marine navigation lights help mariners determine the size, type, and direction of marine craft. This exhibit helps visitors decode these light patterns. Using a light and bell positioned at the end of this pavilion, visitors can investigate how sound perception outdoors can be affected by distance, wind, and temperature. A series of airfoils that rise and fall on vertical cables in response to various wind speeds graph the flow of air. By tracking the airfoils, visitors can observe the diversity in rates of airflow and gain insights into the biomechanics of bird flight in a shoreline environment. But sometimes tracking the airfoils requires a lot of patience. Today, there wasn't much wind and nothing much was happening. And I waited, and waited, and finally decided to come back on another day, when conditions were more conducive to this experiment. The wave organ is located at the very end of a jetty, not far from the Exploratorium. It was constructed from materials taken from a demolished cemetery and reassembled into a kind of weird ancient ruin. It is called the wave organ because the 25 organ pipes, actually made from PVC, produce weird sounds as the waves impact the ends of the pipes, located at various elevations in the bay. The concept for the wave organ was developed by Peter Richards, an artist in residence at the Exploratorium, and built by master stonemason George Gonzalez. Thanks to the fundraising efforts of Exploratorium founding director Frank Oppenheimer, the wave organ was finally completed in May of 1986. The various openings in the wave organ produce different sounds 
from the placement of the pipes in the bay. Wave Oregon is a testament to the city of San Francisco, the city different. What other city would have such a weird, wonderful, whimsical structure as a sentinel in the bay, a harbinger of things to come?